A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? The teacher. Where? The teacher. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. I refuse to go on. Let me out. You refuse to go on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. You can't stand it. I'm not going to kill that man, eh? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff, because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Finicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. The Peace Finicism show is covered by the Bibcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone uh, except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at Bibcot.org. So today I'm delighted to welcome Jim Cunnigan, uh, who's an anarchist, volunteerist, and a physician specializing in psychiatry, and he's coming in from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you can find him on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash J Cunnigan, C U N A G I N. And uh, we're going to talk about his path to volunteerism, um, what inspired him, what uh, books, personalities um, uh, inspired him along the way, as long as the um, you know him being a special uh, his specialty in psychiatry. You have to get his opinion on the 
the most famous um, psychological experiments on human behavior, Stanley Milgram experiment, the Stanford Prison experiment, and the Ash Conformity experiment. So I'm excited to uh, to uh, look into those. So Jim, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh no, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I I heard you on um, I think it was first on Prof CJ and then and then on the um, Anarcho Yakulis podcast with Nick Hazelton. And uh, excellent, excellent interview, chock full of wonderful information, so valuable, so something, you know, things that people, um, you know, even if you're not an anarchist or volunteer, would, would derive great benefits. So, you know. Oh, just, yeah, it's it's interesting stuff. And um, I think I mentioned probably on one, if not both of their shows, that like a lot of people know a, a little bit of this. And I, you know, and I got a little bit of it in college. I was a psychology major. And then I don't know what sparked my interest again and it's like i'm gonna start looking into this and found out there was just so much more <laughs> to it than usually gets mentioned in your you know psycho 101 class or just you know talking to people sitting around when it comes up or whatever but yeah 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 i think most um most volunteers know about it but you know they know the superficial aspects of it um but yeah i'm excited to delve into the the details of it but before we get into that please if you could share with my audience um, what uh, inspired you to become a volunteerist or anarchist? It's more than a little roundabout, probably. Um, I've probably always been inclined to be this way to some degree. I, I, I identified is one of those things, and this is going to come up later, that you're kind of limited sometimes by what options you understand are available. And so in high school, I identified as a liberal. And uh, I, you know, I was kind of taking the word literally part of the reason was why it's like, Oh, okay. This, you know, it's like, let people do what they want. Don't mess with other people. And as long as you're not hurting anybody, that's fine. Um, that was kind of what liberal seemed to mean to me. Um, but I, I remember in like, you know, a, you know, U S government class, which was required in high school for some reason. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we took some sort of test, you know, to determine what our, you know, political leanings were. And like another kid in the class, I remember making a big deal about the fact that I came out as very, very moderate. And it was a standard, you know, single, you know, right, you know, to left test. You know, there was no accounting for, you know, I'm sure if it would have been, you know, had two dimensions to it that, you know, it would have come up with the, you know, cliched, socially liberal, fiscally conservative sort of thing, you know, but it didn't account for that. So when you mix those two up, it just came out as moderate is what I suspect was going on there. Um, then, you know, I, I've never really been pro establishment. Like I graduated high school in 91. So was old enough to vote in the 92 election and, you know, voted Ross Perot because he wasn't the established the establishment mm -hmm. candidate. That, that was, that was as much research as I did. You know, it's like, all right, he's not one of these normal guys. And so that's good enough for me. Um, but wasn't really politically interested or, oh, excuse me, um, motivated for years after that really um until uh like the summer before i started medical school in 1996 when you know america online was still a big deal uh, the social media of its day hmm. uh some girl i met in the you know ohio chat room you know a wild and crazy place the ohio chat room um <laughs> you know at some point said she was a libertarian and then you know it's like what is that? You know, and she explained it to me like, well, yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. You know, it's like, because it always was very bizarre to me, you know, the, how the mishmash of things that get clumped as conventional liberals, you know, on one side, conventional conservatives on the other side. It's like, I like sort of half of what you do and half of what this other guy does. Why, how, you know, it, you know, it didn't make sense how, um, these things get clumped together, but it's like, Oh yeah, no, here's this, you know, here's this third option. I was like, well, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, and so I identified myself as kind of a libertarian party ish libertarian for years after that. Um, I didn't fall into the, what's the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist six months, um, gag. Uh, cause again, I didn't research it. I didn't investigate. I was going to medical school. I had a kid mm -hmm. to raise. I, I had other things on my mind, you know? And so every four years I'd go out and vote for Harry Brown or whatever, but other than that, <laughs> you know, would, or would argue with you know, people you know, and they ever, they wanted, you know, some pro big government stuff. I'm like, no, we, I don't want any of that pro big government stuff at all. Um, and then, uh, you know, years and years later, uh, you know, podcasting became a thing. And I think the first time I ever heard the word anarchist in a way, I'm like, oh, 
Yeah, was I, I think it was on the Lou Rockwell podcast uh, mm. or show or whatever you call it. Anyways, when someone's on that show said, well, an anarchist is someone who believes in voluntary order instead of like coercive top down order. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, and it's like <laughs> I don't need to I don't need to be threatened with a gun to not go kill my neighbor, <laughs> you know, and I don't think my neighbors be being threatened with a gun by someone wearing a badge done to keep from killing me. If I thought I did, they, they did. I'd take considerable precautions um but i don't think they really want to do that and so that was when you know that word really started uh making sense to me and um somewhere in there uh found um the bad quaker podcast and um i can't say I listened to all of them but i listened to all of them from that point forward you know everything he put out um and so, yeah, Ben Stones had a big influence on me. Uh, yeah, and we mentioned, yeah, that there are just so many libertarian, anarcho-libertarian themed, you know, um, there's so much media out there now that is being produced by like-minded people that you can't even, there was a time when I could have all the libertarian podcasts on my, you know, phone and listen to them all, you know, and no, <laughs> not even close now, which, which gives me hope, <laughs> you know, so. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing to see all these little podcasts and shows pop up, mm -hmm. um, you know, people with their websites, and their blogs. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just exploding. And uh, and I think the Internet is doing a, a great job in helping oh, yeah. that explosion, you know. Um, you know, these ideas are just um, given more speed to spread, right, that, mm -hmm. much, that much quicker. Uh, but, you know, you, you mentioned the Lou Rockwell show, and that's definitely one that I was listening to in the very early – time when I was uh, looking into it like maybe 2010 and uh, yeah he really influenced me a lot and uh, that's where I learned about Murray Rothbard's books um, you know he mm -hmm. recommended uh, Anatomy of the State and What Has Government Done to Our Money and A Case for the 100% Gold Dollar um, so that that was my yeah. basic yeah. For, for a new for a new liberty I think is another one that right around that same time you know it's where he just kind of lays out kind of the anarcho-capitalist you know skeleton there you know and it's like here's why it makes sense and here's what it might look like and like yeah and and so i and so i got copies of that to half of half of my family for christmas that year uh, <laughs> really <laughs> yeah I, was, I i i give out subversive literature to my family members for christmas and, and i think half, <laughs> i think half of them read it you know i've given away like defending the undefendable and, oh, and, and sometimes <laughs> it, sometimes they go more philosophy stuff i've given like stuff like on stoicism and um ah. yeah we talked about uh the um the scholar warrior, I gave that to my um, oldest son and my cousin, who is my oldest son's age, they, you know, like a month apart. I gave that to them for Christmas. And um, why not? Is uh, yeah, but for a new liberty, I gave that to a bunch of people. So I, I ended up, I started trying to write all these things down. It's like, did I already give this away last year? <laughs> I don't even want to give duplicates. Um, and, and who wrote that? Um, was it the scholar warrior who wrote that? One? The scholar warrior. I don't know who wrote the scholar warrior. I know. CJ talked about it on his podcast, and I know I've got it around okay. here somewhere. But yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, my my cousin asked me what it was. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like you know, intro to Taoism, but mm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have it. Yeah, yeah, that no, that wasn't here. That wasn't for me. It was a major influence um, in high school. I read the Tao, mm. Tao Te Ching, and I was interested in um, Chinese philosophy as well as Western philosophy, and uh, and that really um, formed the foundation. For me, because I studied, ended up studying acupuncture, mm -hmm. Chinese, Chinese herbs, massage therapy, Eastern nutrition, and all that has basis in uh, Taoism, Taoist principles. And and then later, I you know when learning um, anarchism and voluntarism, discovered that that Lao Tzu, in, in much of his teachings, had very anarchist voluntarist leanings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I, I think Rothbard actually commented on that. That he, he referred to uh, Chuang Tzu as like one of the first anarcho libertarians or something along those lines that yeah, oh, yeah. Lao Tzu. yeah yeah it, it was really interesting to find that out because it's i had been taught you know either directly or indirectly um including in psychology classes you know that uh you know eastern societies are much more collective and the, and the emphasis on society and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and then you know you start reading about Taoism, and it's like this is very individualist mm. you know this is you know um yeah. And, or, or at the very least decentralized you know it's like and it's like all right you want to govern a state and everything taken care of let the people do what they want <laughs> you know and mm -hmm. i'm paraphrasing horribly i'm certain you know but it's like yeah 
govern in a way that they don't even know you're governing, you know, use exactly. that light of a touch mm -hmm. and I'll take care of things. And yeah, yeah, my, which my... was kind of contrary to, you know, the Eastern stereotype that had kind of been fed to me in some way or another for a good chunk of my life. So that was really interesting to pick up. Yeah. My, my favorite, um, Lao Tzu proverb was, or quote was that, um, he said that the, the emperor should rule in the same manner that you would cook a small fish, mm -hmm. which is, you know, very lightly and gently. So almost as if he's not even ruling at all, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, I thought it was really awesome. Uh, you know, laissez faire stand off, you know, type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we can talk about that for a long time, but please, <laughs> I think we should yeah, that's not why I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> all right. that's all right. Uh, yeah. So please get into you, the Stanley Milgram experiment and maybe you give a basic definition of what it is. And, okay. um, and I remember you were mentioning there were some variations too that oh, yeah. are lesser known. So if you can um, right. get into those. Yeah. So, so Stanley Milgram was a social psychologist in the early sixties. He, um, set up these experiments kind of intending to test the limits of human obedience to um, authority, an authority figure. Uh, he was largely inspired by, um, you know, the Nuremberg trials and other you know, such events that he was um, of Jewish descent and so had interest in what had happened in Nazi Germany. And so he, um, and he was a student of Solomon Ash, so which I guess going chronologically, Solomon Ash was a, one of his professors, also a social psychologist who had done some tests um, looking at human, you know, our, our tendency to conform to others, even people we don't, you know, peers, but, you know, strangers. Um, but it was, uh, and so uh, Ash's study was that people would come in and they would look at, you know, they have a projection up on the wall of three lines, you know, A, B, and C of differing lengths. And then there'd be another line off to the right in that line would match one of the ABC lines. And so they were supposed to say which one it was. If you did this by yourself, people almost never missed, you know, it's like, all right, yeah, that line is the same length as B that line this time is the same length as C and, you know, almost never missed, but he put them in a room with other people who they thought were there for the same study, but were really being paid to uh, give false answers. And like, you know, one out of three times, not enough to, you know, completely blow it. Um, but they would give the wrong answer. And a good chunk of the time, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the good chunk of the time, the people would go along with it and they would give varying reasons for this. And like, well, you know, some people were like, I knew they were wrong, but there was this, all this social pressure to say they're, you know, so I said it, even though I knew they were wrong, I said it anyway. Whereas other people were like, it really made me question myself. I'm like, I thought it was B, but everyone else is saying C, maybe I am wrong. And, and was right. they C. So the people that went along with it kind of fell into one or two groups. Um, there were some interesting variations there. Like, um, you know, engineering students didn't conform so much, you know, it's like, which kind of makes sense. You know, these people are into like strict objective measurements, you know, and it's like, this is, you know, 2.5 centimeters long and it's 2.5 centimeters long, no matter what, I don't care what those guys say. So engineering students tended to not conform as much. Um, <laughs> if the lines were, closer together in length you know if there is less discrepancy between the length of the lines then the tendency to conform increased you know so when there was less certainty you know if there was more like oh i thought it was this but they're pretty close so if all those guys say c maybe it is c versus if the lines were you know much greater discrepancy then it's like okay i know those guys are wrong you know mm -hmm. it's like that line's a foot long and they're saying it's the same length as this one that's three inches long <laughs> i don't you know no it's this one um which is something I, you know, it, it's uh, it's very easy to look at some of these experiments and say, oh, well, and kind of give a very pessimistic um, interpretation of what they mean. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, this just means that humans just do what they're told no matter what, you know, referring to the Milgram experiments, um, mm. you know. Um, Peter Gabriel has a song about one of Milgram's experiments and the title is, you know, number 37, you do, we, we, we do what we're told, you know, it's, um, but hmm. you start looking at some of these things, some, what they have in common. And when there's more uncertainty, that's when these things start happening. Uh, you know, it's like, if I'm not sure what to do, but other human beings around me seem to think that the answer, you know, whatever to do, you know, we should do is this, 
being a social species, you know, it's like there's probably some evolutionary survival benefit. And if I don't know what to do, but these guys seem like they know what they're doing, going along with that may give me, you know, give me a chance of surviving and, you know, having progeny down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, Milgram was looking what Ash did and it's like, all right, well, that's all really interesting, but there's no real, this is kind of arbitrary, you know, fluff that if they went against the grain or went with it, big deal. You know, it's like they're saying, you know, this line is the same length as that line or different, you know, what if we have people hurting people? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what, you know, that's what was going on in Nazi Germany. People were hurting people. And then when they were asked about it later, like, well, I was just following orders. This is what they said I was supposed to do. And so I did it. And, you know, a lot of people thought that was bunk. You know, it's like, you're just trying to, you know, blame your superiors. You're trying to get yourself off the hook. But were they was kind of what Milgram was asking himself. You know, it's like, or did they really believe this? That, well, no, if the big boss says I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do this. And even if it's kind of horrible, you know, he's the boss. I got to do it sort of attitude. Yeah. So he set this experiment up testing, you know, that if we are, you know, challenging kind of a, you know, moral rule that a lot of people kind of have ingrained in them, either by training or, genetic, you know, um, nature or whatever, you know, it's like most humans don't go around hurting innocent folks who aren't a threat to them. You know, and, and, and yeah, Milgram actually, oh, there, I wish I had the exact line in front of me, but, but he, he almost like spelled out the nap. <laughs> it was, it was kind of, you know, I'm like reading it. I'm like, oh, I'm highlighting this. Hmm. Um, you know, it's like the people just don't tend to go around and hurt folks if they're, you know, innocent and not a threat to them. Hmm. And so he wanted to, you know, it's like, so can we get people to violate that rule? Uh, because a relatively arbitrary authority figure is telling them to. So, the base experiment was that people would answer an ad in the paper to come to uh, Yale's psychology lab for what they thought was an experiment in teaching and seeing how administering physical punishments would affect people's ability to learn. And they always would show up and there'd be another person there who they thought was another um, person answering the ad for the experiment. But that person was, of course, a paid um, confidant of Milgram's. And they would always rig it so that the person who was actually there to uh, be studied would end up being the teacher. They created, they made it look like they randomized it. It's like, all right, here, you pull the name out, you know, this out of the hat and you pull the other name out of the hat. And they both said teacher. And so the guy would pull it out and say, oh, I'm the teacher. And he's like, yep, you sure are. Um, <laughs> so they would go and take the, you know, the um, guy working with Milgram who said he was there to be in the study and he would be the learner slash victim and you know, so there were three people, the, the learner slash victim who's working for Milgram, the teacher who's the actual subject of the experiment, and then um, the experimenter. So, uh, you know, fairly severe person with a word in a, you know, gray lab coat, you know, so that's, you can get in anywhere if you've got a, you know, clipboard in a gray lab coat. That's, those are, <laughs> those are, those are our cultures, you know, symbols of uh, authority right. and rank. Um, you know, so the, all three of them would go into one room and they would strap the uh, learner slash victim into a chair and place little electrodes on them. Before they do that, they actually had the teacher. It's like, here, fill this electrode. We're going to push the button and give them a 45 volt shock. And, and it's like, well, yeah, this thing delivers shocks. All right. All mm. right. And so, wow. and then, the, and then they would go back in the other room and he would start reading off, you know, word pairs in like two words that didn't really go together. And then he'd say the first one again, and then read off like a multiple choice of four. And the learner is supposed to push a button for whichever the right one is. Um, like one out of three times he would always get it wrong. And every time he gets it wrong, the, uh, teacher slash subject is supposed to deliver a shock going up by 15 volts. And they've got all these little buttons in a row, you know, labeled from mild shock to, you know, medium high, you know, and then finally danger severe. And then just, you know, triple X over the last two shocks, like 450 volts and, uh, you know, has a triple X over it. And so every time he gets it wrong, he pushes the shock button and it keeps going up by, you know, and the guy starts complaining. And then somewhere in 150 volts, he starts saying, that's it. I went out of here. And, you know, so which is where a lot of the big cutoff is, you know, that some people would back off. But like 66 percent of people, you know, so basically two thirds would deliver the entire shock. Now, often they would show some degree of resistance or, you know, ambivalence that they didn't really want to do this. Um, you know, that the videos, you know, the people are like uncomfortable, they're sweating. Um, 
and they use different coping mechanisms. You know, some would blame the learner. You know, it's like, look, if you just get this right, we, I, I wouldn't have to do this, but now it's your fault, you know, and so blaming the victim sort of thing. Mm. Um, they would ask the experimenter, and it's like, do we really have to do this? And, you know, they had various prompts that the experimenter would give if the person complained. You know, it's like, you know, you'd say the experiment must go on. You know, it's, um, you know, the experiment requires that you go on. Um, the last prompt was, you know, you have no choice. You must go on. <laughs> and I, I need to research this because I've heard anecdotally that it, everyone who got that prompt, that if they got to that last prompt, that if they heard that, those people all stopped. Mm. Um, and, and which I've got a theory about that that was like breaking the cognitive dissonance. It's like, you've got no choice. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, it's like the experiment must go on. I'm like, oh, well, you're the boss of the experiment. You know more about this than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Versus you have no choice. I'm like, wait a minute. Now you're talking about me. You know, and now you're talking about my agency, my right. capacity to make choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you're, you're, you're putting the ball back on my court. I know whether I have choices or not. You know, it's, yeah. um, so I need to investigate that and find out if that's uh, that's legit. But, but regardless, in the in the base experiment, you know, while the guy's in there, in like in the last few shots, he starts saying, "I've got a heart condition. You need to stop," and would scream. And then the, the last several things, he would stop even answering the questions whatsoever. You know, so we've created the illusion that he's either lost consciousness or died. And what's kind of ominous, you know, interesting about that is that it takes the supposed reason for the study that the teacher slash um, experiment, experimental subject has been told and throws it right out the window. You know, it's like we're here to learn or, or to do experiment to see how physical punishments affect, you know, learning. This guy's not answering the questions anymore. That we're not, you know, we're not gathering data for this purpose that you said, you know, but mm-hmm. it didn't, you know, no one brought that up. No one said, well, wait a minute. You know, it's uh, the, you know, they said, well, he's not learning as answering anymore. And the experiment would say, if he doesn't answer within five seconds, then you should treat that like it's an incorrect answer and go ahead and deliver the shock. Uh-huh. And they're like, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people did look really uncomfortable. They were all almost always very um, polite to the experimenter. You know, it's they're they're on his home turf, you know, and so they, you know, we're a guest in your home. We should behave accordingly sort of attitude. You know, even the ones who would break with the authority and say, nope, I'm not doing it anymore. You can say all you want. They don't have a choice. You can say all you want that, you know, the experiments go on. I ain't doing it. But, you know, they, they never went out and checked on the victim. <laughs> Despite doing this, they still kind of like had this attitude that it's well, it's your your experiment, it's your responsibility, which was something else the experiment would say if someone ever asked, "Who is responsible? Something bad happens." This guy's like, "I am." Oh, okay, I'll continue killing him because <laughs> you said you're responsible. Um, oh, man. You know, and so we have a remarkable capacity as human beings to believe our own bullshit. Um, <laughs> you know, the imagination is really, you know, it's um, you know that whole double think thing in 1984, yeah, mm-hmm. holding two contrary things in our head at the same time is doesn't create as much a dissonance as we'd like to think it does. But, um, hmm. but yeah, they, even when they said, no, I'm not going to do it. They, you know, were polite to the experimenter. Um, now if they ever flipped that, um, that they had a variation where the learner slash victim would say, Whoa, I'm not sure about this electric shock thing. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. And the, experimenter where you're like oh man this is gonna ruin we're you know behind on getting data tell you what how about you sit in my chair i'll go do your job while the you know teacher shocks me so that you can see it's not that big of a deal Mm -hmm. and then after i've done it you can do it and then you know i'll get two data you know two you know i'll I'll get some extra data out of this night you know for our you know so i can do my you know dissertation in (laughs) graduate psychology and like oh okay that sounds good that sounds good and so they would do this role reversal thing where the authority figure is now the one being shocked and regular Joe Bob is the guy saying, no, 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 no. He said I had to take all the shocks. If he said I have to take all the shocks, he has to take all the shocks. Keep going. And the teacher was, you know, the actual subject experiment was always like, no. Like as, as soon as the um, experimenter, you know, you know, the authority figure getting shocked said, that's it. You know, at shock number 10 or wherever it was, let me out of here. I'm done they stopped, you know, they never, ever kept shocking the authority figure. Hmm. Um, 
we might have, but that's eh, never mind. Um, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they would get, then they would go out up and check on the authority figure. They would go, you know, you know what they never did for regular guy when regular guy was getting shocked to death, they would go and check on him. It's like, are you okay? Are you okay? This guy said, I should keep shocking you and got angry at the, um, you know, the regular guy telling him, you know, so if random guy on the street tells you something, you know, tells another random guy on the street, Hey, let's, you know, do something horrible to somebody. It has no effect, you know? And it's like, you can't tell me to do that. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, were there any other variations that that one came to mind immediately, but there are there other variations that you thought were interesting that you from CJ or um, next show we talked about? Hmm. Well, I don't remember, but um, one of the, one of the ones that I think is especially uh, interesting is they introduced um, to test what uh, Milgram had a hypothesis. So they, they would run a batch of experiments and then they would c introduce a variation. It's like, well, maybe this is going on. Well, let's test it. And so they'd come up with a variation then the, to test their uh, hypothesis about why people were doing this. And one of them was this like, social contract theory they had that, hmm. you know, like, well, the guy signed up and the guy agreed to do it. Hmm. And, you know, once you agree to do it, you can't back out of it. You know, it's a, it's a very um, John Wayne -ish sort of thing. You know, it's like, you you know, you don't back out of a deal you've made, you know, you've shook hands for crying out loud. And it's like, <laughs> he's got, you know, he said he'd do it. So he has to do it. And so they would have the, um, the learner slash victim say, well, you know, I got a heart condition and this shock thing worries me. If I say I want out, can I get out? And the, you know, guy in the lab coat would say, yeah, yeah, you can get out. Um, kind of noncommittally, but agreed, you know, so technically agreed that, yeah, if you say you want to get out of the electric chair, we'll let you out. Mm -hmm. Um, and it didn't make a whole lot of difference. There was like a little bit of increase in resistance to authority. Um, you know, and so, you know, people were granting the guy in the lab coat more authority to do, you know, horrible things to this guy's body than he had himself. You know, he's like, here's my consent. Here's where my consent ends. Don't go past it. Okay. We won't go past it. They went past it, you know, and, um, you know, so the authority figures get to break the rules and people let them, you know, it's like that. Oh yeah. We're, you know, it's like, don't worry. We're going to write up this bill of rights for you. We're not going to cross those lines. And they do, you know, <laughs> and then people are like, well, they're still okay. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, or, you know, the military will say, you know, well, um, subordinates should only follow lawful orders from their superiors. And how much training do they get in identifying a lawful order? Because, well, I've never been in the military, so I don't really know the answer to that question. You know, how much training do they get? You know, but it's kind of like one of these little disclaimer things. It's like, oh, don't follow the order if it's bad. But the entire culture is still, you will follow the orders of your superiors, you know, and right. when it comes down to it, um, you know, it's when it came down to it, they still took the weapons from civilians after Hurricane Katrina. You know, they were still going door to door, taking weapons from people, mm -hmm. you know, which in theory, it's like, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be able to do this. These are innocent civilians. They haven't committed a crime. You know, there's bad things going on around here. They might need to have their firearm. But, you know, somebody in a uniform, you know, with stars or bars on it somewhere said, you know, we're going to go door to door and we're going to wrap up all these guns because they could be dangerous. And they did. Um, you know, was that a lawful order? It, doesn't seem to have been in compliance with, you know, the second amendment as I understand it, but they mm. did it anyway. And I've known people, at least one person, uh, who's actually voluntarist minded who, yeah, didn't have a whole lot of faith that the, you know, that if the government became tyrannical, the troops would save us. Cause he's like, I was one of those guys, you know, I was in new Orleans taking guns from people, hmm. you know, and, and I, and I have this mindset, but you know, when I was there, I had that mindset. And, you know, it's like, I regret doing it. And yeah, but I hmm. don't have a whole lot of faith that, you know, because some people have this idea, yeah, that if the government ever turns 100% tyrannical, um, then the troops will, you know, they're all red blooded, freedom loving Americans, they'll be on our side. It's like, eh. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know. Right. I, 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 you know, it's like, if I had to bet, I bet some, but I'm not going to even guess a percentage, you know, and it's like, and, and it's certainly not going to be all. Um, but yeah, the, the boss gets to, you know, break the rules and still gets to be the boss. Um, but 
again, kind of referring to back um, what I was talking about before, uh, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty on the part of the folks. You know, it's like this was something they were not comfortable with, but they didn't know what the rules were. Um, you know, it's like not, you know, these are not like professional experimental subjects who have been down this road before. You know, it's like they're on this guy's turf, you know, and when in Rome do what the Romans do. And mm. this is weird, but he seems to know more than I do. And so, you know, I don't think it's this blind, we do what we're told thing as much as if I don't know what to do and someone else seems to know what to do, maybe I should listen to him. Mm. Um, there seems to be this underlying mechanism about it. Um, let me try and, but yeah, no, and, and yeah, you, you made me think before you said, um, you know, some of the takeaways that somebody might look at these experiments, um, like, let, yeah, let's say both the Ash Conformity and the Stanley Milgram, mm -hmm. is that, you know, human nature is evil and we just, mm -hmm. um, you know, shirk responsibility and blame our superiors, blame others, and we don't take responsibility for our actions. But um, another way you can look at it is that, no, I think humans uh, always want to please other people. They want to do mm -hmm. good, and they think they're doing good by obeying orders. <laughs> that's, the, right. that's the problem. <laughs> right. That, you know, it's, they, they get in their mind some sort of, that there's some sort of greater good. You know, it's like, right. well, you know, science is being furthered. You know, right. and it's right. like that, um, you know, it, um, you know, he, there was a bit of self-selection going on in Milgram's case that all these people, you know, came to participate in a scientific study, you know, for a whopping four dollars and fifty cents, which admittedly was worth more in 1961 than it is now. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, it's like th they were not making a whole lot of money. You know, they weren't you know, like hired, uh, you know, assassins making, you know, a lot of money. They mm. were they were there because they were, you know, interested in participating and furthering, you know, advancing scientific knowledge and if this is what we got to do to do this well then okay this is what we got to do to do this um you know so they had kind of a built-in recognition of this guy as a legitimate authority figure you know and so in you know perceived legitimacy is a huge thing in the milgram experiment you know mm -hmm. the, okay. that you attack you you know remove the perceived legitimacy of that boss and it went you know like the uh, obedience to authority went to zero. You know, again, when regular guy was sitting there saying, yeah, shock the boss, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, right. They had they had a variation where they would have, you know, two bosses. So they had two people in lab coats and they would say, you know, they would give mismatched orders. So one would say, oh, maybe you should let him out now if he says he wants out. And the other one should say, no, no, keep going. And all of those people stopped. And, you know, as soon as the guy said, let me out, and they were getting conflicting order, you know, conflicting recommendations from the two authority figures. Hmm. They stopped, you know. So again, I haven't been given this sanction by, you know, the greater, you know, by the representative of the greater good of science. And now I'm a regular human being, shocking a regular human being, and well, we don't do that, you know. And so they hmm. stopped. Um, interestingly, they would look to try and figure out which one of them outranked the other one, <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's one of those things I, I kind of wish uh, Milgram would have had done a follow-up study of that. You know, it's like half the guy saying to keep delivering the shocks, you know, say to the other guy, it's like, look, I outrank you on the department chair and see if they, oh, okay. That guy is the big boss. I do what he says, you know, and then do, a, you know, a mirror image of that, have the big boss say, hmm. look, I outrank you. If that guy says, let him out, let him out, you know, and, and see, what happens, but that was never uh, one of the variations that he did. But yeah, if there was no clear authority, then, you know, the, the, the magic spell broke, you know, it's like, it wasn't, I'm a regular human being now. I'm not part of this, you know, machine, you know, that, that is, you know, engineered to provide good. And so hurting people is, I can't rationalize it anymore. So they stopped. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, the magic, um, uh, effect, yeah, definitely is a good way to put it, <laughs> because yeah, when you do have perceived authority, um, they really do believe that these people are exempt from mm -hmm. the regular, uh, ordinary laws of morality that we're all subject to, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the greatest uh, embodiment of that would be the state, and you know mm -hmm. people who act in the name of the state, um, says so being you know they're the government, they don't. The same rules don't apply to them that apply to us, right. the peasants. Right. right. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like they they have to be able to do these things in order to do their job. But like, right. well, 
their job's not all that great. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, so yeah, and, and uh, so, so can you go into a little bit of the um, Stanford Prison Experiment? Okay, um, so uh, that was arranged by a guy named Philip uh, Zimbardo, who went to high school with Stanley Milgram, um, who people who have listened to more than me discuss this more than once are getting tired of me saying how weird must that must have been that they went to high school together. It's like something wrong was going on in the high school. Um, <laughs> but they grew up somewhere in New York. Um, Zimbardo actually kind of had a, um, you know, was like running around with a bit of a bad crowd when he was younger, I guess. Uh, you know, like they would go to like fancy... Um, movies or plays or whatever and would kind of convince people to check their coats and leave a tip when actually there was no you know there's you know they didn't even work there you know it's like hey you want to check your coat here ma'am like ah you know it went like con people uh (laughs) and 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 he actually you know he got arrested once and said you know the cop like smacked smacked his deliberately smacked his head into the roof of the car while he's trying to put him in the car and he's like you know that he's like at that point my you know relationship with authority figures you know changed dramatically right then and there Hmm. um but he ended up working out at Stanford. So Milgram stayed on the East Coast. Uh, Zimbardo went out to the West Coast. And uh, he set up this experiment. That he was interested in, you know, what prisons do to people. And he actually had, um, like, a guy who had spent several years in prison come in and talk to some of his graduate students and whatnot. But he arranged this experiment, you know, wanted to know, you know, if people would ask him, it's like, well, why don't you just go to a prison and see what prisons do to people? I was like, well... The people who, you know, he, he kind of he wanted to look into both the people that work in the prisons and the people who are, you know, in the, in the inmates, the people who are incarcerated there. And if you go to a real prison, those populations, to some degree, at the very least, have selected themselves. You know, it's like you don't, you know, wake up one day, you know, and you're, uh, you know, dry cleaner and then wake up the next day and you're a corrections officer. You know, it's like you go and apply for a job at a corrections officer because you want to be a corrections officer. Mm. Um you know, you may not do it because you've got, you know, all the choices in the world. It may be a limited list, but it's on the list and you pursue it. Um, and same thing with the people who are in prison. It's like they may have done something that we would consider victimless, you know, and they uh, may have not been tried fairly. You know, it's like the list of, you know, reasons why they are not there fairly or not can go on and on and on. But something happened. They're there. It's there's a selected population to some degree. So he wanted to know what would happen to, you know, quote unquote, normal people Hmm. if they were in prison. And so he had a number of people, like some of them, a good number of them were like psychology students. um, But a lot of them were young, you know, most, almost all of them were young adults and they all volunteered to be in this study and get paid a certain amount. I forget like $7 a day or something. I'm probably off with that, but um, they were getting paid Hmm. and it was supposed to run for two weeks and they were going to be randomized to either be, you know, the corrections officers, the, you know, quote unquote guards or the inmates. They all, each and every one of them stated a preference to be an inmate. Like none of them wanted to be the guard. Oh, really? And almost, and almost every single one of them said, because I can see a possibility where I may be in prison someday. That might happen. <laughs> and so mm. I'd rather do that. And none of them were like, yeah, I, I, I can see myself getting a job in you know, corrections. That, you know, n- none of them could identify with that whatsoever. Hmm. Uh, one guy actually I did identify himself as an anarchist. He did, I, I also identified himself as a socialist. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, everybody, if they would have had their choice, would have been an inmate. Hmm. Uh, but they randomized it and – there was, it was so badly done because <laughs> um, they really muddied the waters. And again, the, the uncertainty thing I mentioned before really takes place. Uh, it takes, um, is relevant here, you know, that they would have, you know, real people. They had like a real chaplain come in at one point and, and talk to these guys. And he's like, well, I told them that I'm going to talk to their parents and talk to their parents about getting a lawyer. Cause the chaplain was used to going and visiting people in prisons. This is what he did. And so he, did what he usually does um you know and so these parents who think their children are in a you know psychology experiment at stanford are being told by this chaplain you should call a lawyer about getting you know representation for him in prison like and so the <laughs> line between you know it's like reality and what wasn't real was not well defined hmm. um you know, but things got ugly fast uh you know the guards all like went to the local um army surplus store and got you know 
battle fatigues to wear and had mirrored sunglasses and carried, you know, billy clubs and whatnot. Um, the prisoners all had like smocks that were, you know, little more than like potato sacks with arms, you know, cut off for their, you know, head to come through and arms to go through and had like numbers you know, attached to them. You know, they were referred to by their number. They weren't supposed to be referred to by their names. Hmm. Um, and they had, you know, a little, you know, um, solitary confinement cell in a closet. Uh, they had a list of rules they were supposed to follow. And, you know, the rules included, you know, it's like you will not refer to this as an experiment, which, again, you know, it's like for safety's sake, you know, it's like, you know, they consented to be in this. They're allowed to withdraw, but you're also kind of telling them you're not allowed to mention, you know, withdrawing, you know, it's, um, it, but things got ugly fast. You know, the, um, the guards got abusive. The prisoner started, you know, doing very poorly emotionally and freaking out. And they actually let one guy that the anarchist socialist, um, he was the first guy to be released like two, three days into it that he just, wasn't eating and wasn't, he was an emotional mess. And like, Hmm. um, but the power that this situation that they created had on them, when you're reading this, you just, you know, got your head in your hands. Cause Zimbardo, he, again, he, he was part of this mess, you know, cause he had this dual role. He's the principal investigator in this psychological study and he's playing the prison superintendent, you know? And so there's kind of a conflict of interest there, you know, that, yeah. A, he wants to keep the study going no matter what. And so it's kind of allowing things to go. And he kind of admits this, you know, he's like, I didn't want my study to get blown. Mm-hmm. So and it's like, Oh, the guards are being rougher on the inmates than we liked, you know, but we told them not to physically abuse them and they're not physically abusing them. They're making them do push ups, and, you know, they're, you know, calling them degrading names and threatening them and whatnot. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the show must go on, you know? And so, you know, again, there's this, you know, the, the, idea that there's this greater good that warrants all of this, you know, it's like, um, behavior. Uh, but eventually, you know, in, you know, they, the, near the end of the study, the guards were like having the inmates, you know, mimic, um, sodomizing each other. They had like half of them, you know, kneel down in front of the other half and, you know, again, they're wearing smocks with no underwear and it's like, all right, now get behind him and pretend like you're having sex with him. Hmm. Um, you know, so, so yeah, sexually degrading stuff. Hmm. Um, you know, the the people, they were keeping them in this, the, the, um, solitary confinement for, you know, prolonged periods of time. One of them went on a hunger strike and, uh, you know, they had the other inmates come and yell at him. They started doing this thing where, you know, have you seen, um, full metal jacket, yeah, a while ago. Okay, yeah. where yeah, the uh, the one uh, recruit isn't doing well, and he has like a donut in his locker, and you know, at some point, the um, drill sergeant's like, instead of punishing you, I'm gonna punish everybody else. You know, so they're doing this when the, the guy was on his hunger strike, they would punish everybody else, make them do extra push ups, make them do extra work, and hmm. whatnot. Hmm. And so they all turned against him, you know, and um, you know, he was trying to get out but he was trying to get out by playing by the rules um which is what a lot of them did you know they had mock parole board hearings and um at these parole board hearings they would ask them it's like if you could give up all the money that you were going to get paid for the study in order to get paroled here today would you do that and i think with one or two exceptions they said yeah yeah i don't want the money let me go Hmm. um and you read this and again, it just floors you because, you know, the, you know, Zimbardo is asking them one thing and he's phrasing it in a certain way. It's like if we, you know, and again, he's mixing this reality and the fantasy part of it. You know, it's like if we give you back the, you know, if you, if we, if, if we don't pay you the money for the experiment, you know, would you be willing to do that in order to get parole, which is the fantasy part of it, you know, not let you out of the experiment parole you know where the prison decides to let you go Hmm. and they all said yes they all think they're saying yeah let me out i don't want the money anymore you know they're not here in the parole part of it they know they're just hearing Hmm. yeah if that's an option for you to get out of this this sucks let me out i don't want the money anymore and they're saying all right well parole denied you're all going back to parole prison (laughs) and and the lesson for them is i i really can't get out of this you know and it's like i thought this was just this study that you know and it's like and 
now I can't get out. Um, and yeah, and they were just all hopeless and demoralized. And, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, and like Zimbardo didn't talk about the study much for years. And then, you know, eventually what happened was uh, his girlfriend, who had just graduated with her PhD from social psychology from Stanford, came by to see what was going on. And they had like the guys, there was no bathroom in the little basement where they had their prison set up. So they had all the guys, they would put bags over their head and chain them all together. And, you know, so that they couldn't see the outside world, you know, it's like wanted their whole world to be this prison, you mm-hmm. know. And so, well, they got to go to the bathroom, but we only need to let them know where they're going or where it is. And we don't want them to see the sun or people or anything. So they would put bags over their heads, chain them together and then march them. You know, and they're doing this while his girlfriend is there, like reading something. He's like, oh, oh, look at this. Look at this. They're, they're taking the prisoners to the bathroom. And she's like, yeah, I saw it. And he's like, but, but but look, look, at it. she's like, this is horrible. What you're doing to these kids is awful. And he initially argued with her and I got a big argument. You know, again, he was in this, you know, damn it, this is science, lady. Don't you get that? Right. You know, and like challenged, you know, her convictions. You know, it's like, what sort of PhD psychologist are you going to be if you can't even, you know, you know, suspend your, you know, whatever and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and then like, you know, that night he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> she's entirely right. <laughs> um, I'm going to call this off first thing in the morning. Uh, you know, he didn't call it off then. First you know, thing um, the yeah. First thing I'm going to call it off, but not just yet. Um, <laughs> I'm which I'm is when a, the, I'm going to have a good night's sleep first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is what, which was when the mock sodomy thing was happening. That oh. very night. Um, and so it, it, they did some interesting stuff. Like, you know, took everyone afterwards and interviewed them. Um, you know, and most of the guards were like, like got into the role, you know, and most of them said they, I think, I suspect some of them enjoyed it more than they thought they did. Um, or more than they admitted they did. Cause who's not going to, you know, who's going to admit it's like, yeah, that was great when we all had them doing that. That was hilarious. Um, mm. but I think some of what they said was legit too. It's like, I wasn't enjoying that, but I had a job to do, mm. you know, it's like, and again, you know, it's like, um, you know, they were dressed for the role and, you know, uh, you know, and how much, and I mentioned this to CJ, I think too, that, you know, it's an interesting artifact, I think, of having people who have never worked in a prison or been in a prison in this experiment. And then you give them this role, where are they getting the information for this role? Mm-hmm. Most likely from TV and movies, right. you know, and so the guards are like, all right, well, we know how prison guards act in movies. That's the best, you know, indication we have. And, and same thing for the prisoners. You know, like the prisoners started talking escape, like within you know twenty four hours of being in this prison. Um, which, you know, it's my understanding that a good amount of folks want to serve their time, not get in trouble, to go home. You know, it's like, but in TV and movies, you know, that's you know, if there's not an escape plot in a TV or a movie about prison, then that, 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 what, who's going to watch that? You know, that's <laughs> right. what that, that's what that's what those things are all about. Right. Um, but, you know, so they were like, yeah, I, I wasn't enthusiastic about what I was doing, but I had a job to do and I was getting paid to do it and I was going to do a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and part of Zimbardo's instructions were, you know, we want, you know, they it, more or less, he said he really wanted to demoralize the inmates. You know, he wanted to make them, you know, without physically harming them, you know, just really, you know, break their spirit in so many words. Um some details about it that I think were really interesting, you know, was that how the guy on the hunger strike, they just went, you know, the guards went ballistic on him. Uh, again, they never laid a finger on him, you know, but they would put him in the solitary confinement and then just pound on the door. So you're in a little closet and people are pounding on the door nonstop. The other inmates are coming by and yelling insults in, at you on the directions of the guards who are punishing them for your um, supposed disobedience. Hmm. And they were twisting the rules. You know, so again, I mentioned kind of, you know, before, not only does the authority get to break the rules and they still get to do what they want, but they get to twist the rules and, and use them against you. Um, so there was a rule saying, you know, inmates eat at mealtimes, you know, and which was intended to keep them from having food whenever they wanted, you know, and sneaking food away from meal times and need to get in their cells and making a mess and attracting bugs, whatever it was kind of the spirit of the rule. Mm-hmm. But as far as the guards were concerned, the rule says you eat at meal times. You're not eating. Therefore you're breaking this rule. Like that's not the spirit of the rule at all. You know, it's like, hmm. you know, but 
it became, you know, it's like they're, we're, we're following the letter of the law. It says you eat at mealtimes. And if you're not eating at mealtimes, you're breaking the rules. Therefore, we get to punish you. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, um, and ne- ne- never write, never have a law that you're willing, you know, unless you're willing to have your worst enemy, you know, enforce it. Because uh, they'll find some way to twist it and right. um, use it against you. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. These things are yeah. It's just amazing how, uh, like you said, these people who did not have any experience being in prison as an inmate or as a as a mm-hmm. as a guard, and how they just embodied it completely, and um, and just you know like the prison. Yeah, I mean, it, be- it became down. their lives. Right. Um, they had audio recording. It wasn't twenty four seven, but they had audio recording in the you know the quote unquote cells. You know, so they had like a little common area, and then they had rooms with bunk beds. You know, that which were served as the cells. Uh, and so they would listen to what the guys were talking about in there, and they didn't talk about, you know, what do you do for in your real life? What were you doing last week? Do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a job? Hmm. What are you gonna do when you get out of here? They talked about life then and there. You know, it's like that was. That was the sum, you know, that was their, you know, that was their universe mm-hmm. at the time is, is the implication. Um, now, some of that I don't think is too terribly unusual. Like Zimbardo made a big deal about this. You know, it's like, well, why wouldn't they talk about their girlfriends? Like something big and dramatic changes your life. That kind of becomes the topic of conversation and the thing that's most on your brain. And that definitely describes what's happened to these guys. Um, you know, so. I'm not terribly surprised they talked about that a lot, but the fact that they talked about that exclusively, you know, and, mm. um, uh, yeah, that, that's just, yeah, they, they didn't talk about anything else. You know, as they had lives, they were normal people a week ago. Mm-hmm. They expected to become normal people again in two weeks. They stopped the study a week early, you know, after this whole thing was in and his girlfriend and he realized how much he'd let it get out of hand, you know, mm-hmm. but they had every reason you know, still to think this is going on for two weeks. That's what it's like of the dotted line. Maybe they give a poop on that. I don't know. Um, hmm. you know, it's time kind of got messed up for them. You know, they weren't allowed to sleep through the night fully. You know, they would, um, the guards at night, uh, were the most, um, most cruel to them. They would, you know, wake them up at two in the morning and have, you know, come out, out and count, you know, and they'd have everyone would have to recite their number. And then they, all right, now I recite your numbers backwards and I'll sing it and I'll do this and sing it while standing on one foot, you know, and hop. And wow. it's just like, you know, it's like none of this, uh, you know, is necessary for the running of a prison. You know, this is all right. spinning off of, you know, it seems to me from Zimbardo's, it's like, we want to make these people hopeless and we want to, you know, really, make them feel miserable mm. oh okay we can do that you know and it's like and, and it's just giving arbitrary crap to do you know it's um you know you didn't do it good enough do it again you know and um hmm. uh yeah they when they were in the bathroom they kept their bag over their head in the bathroom and so they're trying to use a urinal with a bag over their head and the guards would like shove them in the you know in the back while they're in the middle of taking a leak you know it's just um hmm. uh, just really nasty nasty stuff uh yeah, yeah, and I remember you mentioned um, how the guidelines have changed now for experiments such as this that they couldn't be replicated today. <laughs> right. Um, right. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually need to apologize, to CJ, because I've done a little bit more reading. They, they've done not experiments exactly like this, but they've done some reproductions. Uh, there was something done, and I, I forget the details, but Australia, there was a study done on Australia that was in the same vein. Mm. Uh, and I, I remember, you know, the general gist was that there were similar findings that, you know, the, the people really adopted their roles to the point where it was concerning. Um, and similar things have been actually been done, you know, speaking of, as I'm a psychiatrist have been done in psychiatric inpatient units. Um, I don't know if any of them been done recently, you know, and a lot of these are kind of old studies, but like people would um, like, you know, they would arrange for somebody to be admitted to a psychiatric unit with, you know, whatever concerning symptoms, you know, say they were, you know, hearing hallucinations and then they get admitted to the unit, but then never mention it again. You know, it's like, so you got admitted for hallucinations. Yep. You've been having that since you've been here. Nope. And they were still not treated all that well and treated as a, you know, as if they were, you know, you know, they were still there like a week later, you know, it's like, now this was in the seventies when people were 
you know, in the mental health field were largely influenced by um, Freud's ideas, you know, mm. and so I think that's an artifact, you know, it's like, as far as Freud was concerned, if you had a quick fix, that was a concern that something bad was happening, you know, and so I think that affected some of it. And, you know, in this day and age, you know, if, it, if you're fine the next day, they're probably going to ship you home because you, your insurance isn't going to pay for it if you're not, you know, on the verge of killing yourself. And uh, it's kind of how things work um, at this time. But, hmm. you know, they, they still, you know, the role took precedence kind of over the individual and, you know, the facts. You know, it's like, all right, this guy hasn't said he's heard voices for a week. Why is he still here? Why are you mm. calling him schizophrenic? Why, you know, it's like, why did you not ever question this? You know, it's, um, mm. and that's something I would tell, I, I used to work with um, resident physicians. I, I used to be a board family, uh, I used to be board certified in family medicine too, uh, and then stopped pursuing that for a number of reasons. Um, but there's definitely a tendency, you know, for, you know, we like to believe people in our in-group know what they're doing and know what they're, you know, and aren't, aren't screwing up, right. you know? And so, you know, patient shows up and says, I'm on this medicine, this medicine, this medicine, because Dr. So-and-so gave it to me. And it's like, oh, well, okay, I want to keep continuing his medicines. And I'd ask the intern, it's like, are those medicines a good idea? And it's like, I don't like this for, you know, for, um, and I don't have a hypothetical example, but it's like, yeah, this is a bad idea. We don't use these medicines for this condition, but, Another doctor said he was doing it, for, or the, you know, we didn't even hear that other doctor. This patient said the other doctor did it first. Mm. Therefore, oh, it's good enough, you know, to you know get continued and never ever, you know, assume the doctor that saw the patient before you knows what they're doing is <laughs> something that I said a few times, and I probably should have said it more often than I did, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, yeah, you can't uh, you can't always trust another person's judgment. I mean, I mean, I, I do acupuncture and Chinese herbs, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't necessarily like if a person went to another acupuncturist i wouldn't necessarily coast on that person's judgment you know you you got to make your own uh, right. evaluation and study the patient in their present state as they are mm-hmm. you know, things change all the time so um yeah, you cannot be um intellectually lazy that mm-hmm. way very uh very important um but uh, but yes yeah, so we're coming yeah, at the end of the day it, it, it's it's kind of um one of the things that has been discussed as far as uh, giving people resistance to, you know, Milgramian sort of influence is, you know, it's your name on that dotted line at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you are responsible, regardless of that guy in the lab coat said, regardless of whoever saw that person before you, you're responsible for what you did, you know, and that that's kind of like a cold slap in the face. You know, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I'm not going to do this then. <laughs> it's like, if it's, right. you know, it's, uh, you know, if you're responsible for your own actions, um, that and, and you're cognizant of that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of a truism in the universe is that, yeah, you're responsible for your own actions. But mm-hmm. if you are oblivious to that, if you don't believe that to be the case, then you act as if that is not the case. Um, and so that's one thing that's been recommended is, you know, really reinforcing you are responsible, not that guy in that lab coat. And so that tends to um, short circuit some of the effects that that sort of thing has. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that forms the um, yeah the foundation of what volunteerism is 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 uh, assuming personal responsibility and accountability mm-hmm. for your actions. And you know, every person has self ownership and and can control the means um, you know by which they act and you know and the right. and their labor and the fruits of their labor. So yeah, yeah. So all of that goes hand in hand. So so awesome uh, awesome information. Um, so before I let you go, uh, I'd like to ask all my guests. Um, what is your favorite quote of all time? Oh, holy cow. Um, <laughs> oh, whew. oh man, you could have given me a little warning on this one. <laughs> quote of all time. I like to catch people off guard. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been chewing over two things, and I'm paraphrasing, modifying slightly, two things Obi-Wan Kenobi said. Um, <laughs> is... Uh, the you know the the infamous you know uh, many of the truths we cling to depend greatly upon our point of view, hmm. um, which I think is relevant for some of the things we talked about here. Because yeah, if your point of view is I'm not responsible, then you'll behave as if you are not responsible. Hmm. Um, and uh, the other one being um, from Episode Four, it's like you must do what you think is right. Of course, he said feel. I don't like saying feel. I like saying think. You must do what you think is right. Of course. Hmm. Um, 
that I, I, I sometimes think I could build an entire philosophy of life around those two quotes, you know, that, hmm. you know, because, yeah, you, you must do what you think is right. And what you think is true is going to depend a lot, you know, on your point of view. Um, a close third might be from Splinter from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. <laughs> I like your sources. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I, I love getting snippets of wisdom where people don't look for it. I know. Um, but um, yeah, Splinter said, you know, my master Hamato Yoshi's first lesson always was possess the right thinking. Uh, um, which I think works well with those other two. It's like, all right, yeah, that the truths you claim to you depend greatly on your point of view, but possess the right thinking. You know, so your point of view matters. Make sure your point of view doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and um, you know, some some people criticize me for focusing so much on um, you know philosophy, economics, morality, because you know when I talk to people in my writing and my in my videos. I don't necessarily like to talk about current events or this politician mm -hmm. or that law or, or that regulation. You know, I don't really talk about that. I talk about underlying principles. Like, yeah. I want to know how you think, right? Mm -hmm. Because to me, um, that's much more important than, you know, who won the election or what law was right. just passed, you know? Right. Because if you don't really have a clear understanding of, of principles and why you're acting a certain way, and, you know, if a person has problems in their life or, you know, problems with relationships or with other people, and they're like, why do we have so many problems? Well, first thing is, what are your principles? What are you acting up? What are you acting upon? The, that's what's most important. When you're talking about right Thank thinking, you. that's what I want to know is what, is what are the principles that you're using as a foundation for your life? For your right. That, that reminded me. I, I had intended to bring a philosophy angle into this um, as far as means of resistance for these sorts of things um because we, we mentioned that my, my daughter uh, does go to a school in a homeschool where I like you know it, it, it's one of those things that if i had my druthers you know if i wasn't you know working four days a week and my wife wasn't working i'd like to do but mm. i do um make sure i'm influencing ideas that she has mm -hmm. and um i at some point um was discussing it with her um Diogenes of Sinope, so like ancient Greek cynic philosopher, mm. uh, and how he, you know, and so a lot of what he did was just anti-conformist. That's like, it was like a big chunk of what cynicism was about, and, you know, it's, which some of the cynics I know were, here, you know, people who are fans of cynicism are cringe at that oversimplification, but that was a big chunk of it. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the, the guy would walk backwards through credit marketplaces just because everyone else was walking forwards in that direction, he would walk backwards in the other direction just to not be them. Um, <laughs> and so I've got a children's book about him, you know, that I've read to my daughter and my um, son, and she would ask me some questions about him, and I would tell him some about this stuff, and I would talk about, and so I think maybe that was overdoing it, the walking backwards to the credit marketplace, that would <laughs> kind of tick me off. It's like, look, enough of the street theater, I got a place to be, dude, you know, get out of my way. Um, but he developed, you know, a tolerance to social pressure you know it's like everyone else is doing this i'm doing that you know that if he you know that if he's sitting in that line and they're like which one of these lines is the same as this one all of these guys say it's that one he's like i don't care what they say you know it's like he's you know <laughs> building up a tolerance to doing that sort of thing hmm. um so yeah i think having some understanding of philosophy is you know and you know pick and choose your philosophy can really be relevant, you know, in, in some of these areas and kind of, you know, establishing a stoicism is another one that I'm interested in, you know, it's like in a big part of stoicism is like, you know, you choose, you know, it's like, that's, you know, maintaining your capacity to choose and make the right choice, you know, rather than being persuaded by this, that, or the other external things mm -hmm. is a big, big thing in stoicism. And so, you know, I, I see that as having some, um, potential protective effect in dealing with some of these things too. Um, cause I, I know we're going over an hour here, but no, it's fine. Um, um, I actually had an example, not of exactly a Milgramian or um, Stanford thing, but just how social pressure mm -hmm. affected me. And it's like, ah, oh, damn it. I should have seen that coming. Um, I went to go to the post office to mail a check. I mm -hmm. was buying some, um, I was ordering some bees cause I'm expanding my beekeeping thing that I uh, do this spring. And so I had a check for like 800 bucks in this envelope and I pull into the post office and there's just they have the mailboxes you drop your envelope in. And there's a guy standing there and he's just taking the envelopes from the people. Hmm. And he's not in a post office uniform. Mm 
Mm. And I'm in the line with the other cars behind me, you know, and I handed him the envelope and then drove on. And like, as soon as I pull out the envelope, I'm like, I don't know who that was. <laughs> what the? You know, it's like, but there was this social expectation, you know, as I was like, you know, there's cars behind me, you know, it's like in the whole, you know, thing with the people in the Milgram experiment, you know, not wanting to challenge the guy too much because this is his thing, you know, like, all right, I'm not going to, who the hell are you, dude? Why are you taking these envelopes? <laughs> and I hand it to him and afterwards, I'm like, I'm not doing that again. You know, it's like, I'm going to like, sorry, dude. And it's like, uh, you know, I may not confirm to his face, but I'm like, I'm going to pull around and park and I'll go in the post office if I won't, you know, I have to. Right. I was like, I check for 800 bucks in here. I don't right. know who this guy is. You know, <laughs> now the beekeeping company, you know, sent me the receipt and I, you know, they got the money. So it's like, okay, whew, it all worked out. But yeah, <laughs> it, it was just one of these, you know, and it wasn't that, you know, no one was getting hurt. You know, I, I, I the potential loss more lose money, but it's like, that was exceptionally foolish, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, everyone's in line, everyone's doing this. And it's like, all right, so. Right. You know, le- learn from my mistakes, Jim. You know, it's um... yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. Um, you, you know, you reminded me of something when you were saying about um, you know, we were talking about principles in philosophy. Um, that a lot of um, teenagers, you know, the the, the typical or the uh, stereotypical rebellious teenager phase where they just rebel mm-hmm. against whatever the parent says for no particular reason, no philosophical principle underlying their behavior, just, I don't want to do what you say, right? And so that's in stark contrast to anarchists and voluntarists because mm-hmm. we're not just rebelling against authority for the sake of rebelling, but right. we do have an underlying philosophy you know, of self-ownership and property rights and non-aggression and we uh, we outline very particularly why um, the state is illegitimate, and, right, um, right, and why it does not have jurisdiction. And so I think that's the fundamental difference um, between you know and and uh, just an arbitrary um, you know um, refusal to submit to authority and someone who has principles that they're acting upon. Right. Yeah. No. Um, going back to the beginning, like I mentioned, I was in high school, and I I had this kind of like. Uh, affinity for you know hippies back when they actually you know were opposed to the government before they all grew up and you know <laughs> became big fans of it you know and so at some point my high school they were having you know they were trying to pass a levy you know for money for the high school and like a bunch of the students were upset because the, the students wanted to pass the levy and they're and they're like gonna you know, like organize a protest i'm like yeah so you want to go to the protest right jim because you're all about this stuff i'm like no <laughs> it's like i was just arbitrarily oh any arbitrary protest yeah i'm there i'm all for that it's like <laughs> I, i'm entirely opposed to the ideas that you're going to you know <laughs> this yeah i i i actually not a fan of this school and it, i was even saying then like me and my friends were like this is this is state-sponsored babysitting for teenagers that's what this is you know it's um <laughs> and right. so yeah i was uh no i'm not in a big fan of it, raising the property taxes on anybody around here. I don't think they need to pay for this if they don't want to. Right. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, if, if Donald Trump went on the news tomorrow and said, whatever you do, don't kill and eat your neighbors, I'm not going to kill and eat my neighbors just to spite Donald Trump. You know, it's like, yeah, that, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, just the, 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 the blind, you know, um, rebellion. Yeah, that that's, I'm, I'm sure some people think that's what we are all about. And it's like, oh, you're just trying to be edgy. You know, you're just trying to recapture your teen years. Now that you're in your 40s, Jim. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's no, I, I, there, there, there's some ideas here that I think are important and I think are worth adhering to. And it's, um, which is why I oppose, you know, people being bombed in the Middle East, regardless of the, you know, whether they have a D or an R after their name or their skin color, you know, and it's like, yeah, it was bad when bush did it it's bad when obama did it it's bad when trump did it and it'll be bad when the next guy does it most likely you know it's which is unfortunately i think that's likely but yeah yeah i'll I'll be thrilled to death if i'm surprised you know i will not be upset about being wrong on that bet yeah i mean the question is um to people who advocate for the state is where do you get your morality from where do you Mm -hmm. derive your moral principles you know is it from the law from what politicians tell you right. or from your yeah. own um, uh, conscience or moral compass. Uh, and it's very important to um, outline that, you know, well, mm-hmm. what are your principles? That's, it's, it, I, I can't, I, I don't harp on that. I can't harp on that enough. Right. Uh, when I talk to people, uh, it's such an important thing. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you heard of a recent, um, um, it's a recent case with, uh, with an Amish farmer from Kentucky that uh, that just 
was uh, like had his farm raided because he had um, some topical salve that he was making out of chickweed, um, and it wasn't mm-hmm. F- it wasn't FDA approved, and mm-hmm. so and so he um, he was like his farm was raided. I think you know armed uh, SWAT team, you know no knock raid, guns drawn, everything. Amish farmer, and and they charged him for like you know not having an FDA approved product, and now he's facing he he could get. 48 years in in prison 48 years <laughs> and, and and the and in Kentucky I think the the uh the, the the punishment for murder is like 10 to 12 years oh yeah <laughs> you know it's like, yeah, it's like who who has this guy hurt you know it's like where where are the offended consumers you know? right no yeah yes. yeah nobody um, so. it's, it's it's funny to say that cuz yeah my my wife makes um soap and so there are ongoing issues with the FDA and like home soap makers because home soap making is a big thing apparently. <laughs> um, you know, but this last year, as at Pork Fest and also at the um, the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest in Michigan, um, and, and I would take some of her soap and sell it, and I would, I would make a point to say she uses the honey from my beehives in her soap, and I always say it's like now. The FDA says you can't say that this is a moisturizing product because it hasn't gotten their approval. <laughs> <clears throat> but there's honey in all of the soaps, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, which is which is great marketing. <laughs> it's like the FDA says I can't say this about my product. Right. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and then yeah, and then and then the libertarians just love it. You know, it's like know. oh yeah, <laughs> give me one, give, give me give me give me three of those. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome conversation, Jim. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, sharing this very important information. Um, so, so maybe uh, so, so. The only place people can find you is on Facebook, right? That Facebook. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm on Twitter. I think is J. Cunnigan, but I'm I'm I barely ever do anything on Twitter. Okay. I, I I'm I'm mostly on Twitter to keep track of Ben Stone since Ben Stone is not on Facebook, so I want to see what he says and does. Mm. Um, but uh, it's I'm going to be again in the near future. Again, like I said, I I do beekeeping on the side. I've um, set up an open bazaar uh, page, which I don't have my computer hooked up. So um, it's, are you familiar with open bazaar at all? No. It, it, it's it, if like, if Napster and eBay had a baby, it would be open bazaar. So like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a peer to peer thing. Like, you oh, know, nice. your music was on your computer and right. the people would get the music off of your computer directly to their computer. Right. So that's the way the marketplace is. Your computer is your store. You know, it's not on eBay's website or whatever. Ah. Um, and so my computer's off right now and because I don't have any honey to sell, but I'm going to set that back up again. But Agora Apiaries, A-G-O-R-A, you know, Apiaries, okay. uh, is going to be my uh, open bazaar thing. I'll, I'll have honey and I've got, you know, T-shirts that say don't tread on bees on them and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> awesome. so and so there is that. There, I, there is an Agora Apiaries uh, Facebook page, but I, I haven't had much to post on there now. But as it's getting closer to, uh, you know, beekeeping season, as the weather warms up, I might be posting more stuff there. Um, cool. So it's you know, called, I it's like called, bees. They don't. They don't care who the president is. You know, go out and <laughs> right. engage, engage in benef, mutually beneficial exchanges with flowers out in the world, and then they go back home. And uh, they don't mess with you. But if you mess with their territory, then they'll let you know in a you know hostile manner. So it's um, actually another side tangent you just reminded me of. Um, oh yeah. I was I was listening to the um, I don't know if you heard of the An Architecture podcast. Um, these two as guys, an architecture. It's called an architecture podcast. These okay. two, these two. I think one guy's an engineer, the other guy's an, ar- an architect, and they're they're twin brothers. One of them lives in in Boston, the other one lives in Australia, and, they, and this is their podcast, right, about uh-huh. an- anarchism and as it relates to um, the built environment, which is you know buildings and bridges and roads. How do you do right, that right, without right. the state? And um, and one um, episode, he was talking about the ant. Um, colonies and the ant culture and society mm-hmm. and how so many people equate that as being, look at that, isn't that a wonderful example of central planning, right? Because you have a queen, oh. you have a queen and you have all these workers that have specific roles and there's a high, clear hierarchy and they don't, ha- they don't have immediate knowledge of the other uh, workers, um, you know, job, they have very specific roles. I guess same thing in a bee, beehive, right? Right. Um, and so, and he was saying that no, actually, that is more accurately a reflection of an anarchic society or spontaneous it's, order. There's more spontaneous order there than there is anything else. Absolutely. Right, right, because the queen um, doesn't necessarily give commands. Like she's basically stuck. No. She can't move. She's, 
she she's a means of reproduction is how I've had people right. <laughs> bring it up. You know, she she lays eggs and she kind of lays eggs where she's where she's told to by the other workers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and and they are comforted by her. If she if she is gone, they kind of freak out because then they're the you know the colony's going to die. But right. yeah, she has no say in it. You know, and there's like a few set rules about how you know, things get organized, you know, it's like, if there's too much space here. They put wax there and then they fill the wax with honey. Or if there's not enough space here, they put other stuff there. Right. Um, but it, yeah, there's, there's no central command organizing any of that stuff. You know, it's just, right. And, and, um, and, and one of the interesting things he said was that even though the workers, um, the individual ants have specific roles, um, depending on this changing in the circumstances, like let's say there's a, 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 um, a predator that comes and attacks their colony, they all of a sudden go to defend the colony. They abandon right. their roles and they go to defend. Or if if they need, I don't know, if, if a bunch of ants get killed, they then other workers change their roles to fill in yeah. for that role. So so there's complete, there's always um, fluidity and change mm-hmm. to adapt to what's needed. And mm-hmm. so I, it's, yeah, it's fascinating um, because, yeah, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it kind of reminded me. So I guess, yeah, bees are very similar, right, to ants in yeah. that way? Mm-hmm. All right, so awesome. I need, I need to find that podcast now. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you. I'll definitely include that. It's really awesome. All right. Uh, but uh, awesome talking to Jim. Uh, so if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through um, Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal. Uh, links are below. Um, that's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out a dollar show is all i ask i uh, love interviewing fascinating people like jim here and i would love to do more of it um, monetary compensation is always encouraged and appreciated right we are capitalists in the end we respond to incentives <laughs> even though I, I offer these these videos for free um we all know that there's no such thing as free time there's always opportunity cost for everything that we do right we're doing something we're not doing something else so um no please help me to uh, encourage me to do more of these uh, through your donations. So, um, so yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. I really appreciate the conversation. Oh. Nope. Again, thanks for having me. I enjoyed doing this. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and thesseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Right, take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, Please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, Sign up for my newsletter and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.